Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship on Sunday, the 14th of February. Any church needs some notices, so we'll begin with those. Firstly, we are able to meet again as lockdown has eased, and so we are meeting in person on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock in the hall. Please join us if you can, but don't worry, we will continue to have online services going as well. Secondly, next week, Lent begins. It is Ash Wednesday next Wednesday. We will have an Ash Wednesday service in the hall at 6 p.m., but we will also have an Ash Wednesday service posted on the internet, on the site that you're at at the moment, for the service on Ash Wednesday. Lent normally has a Lent course. We continue with our Lent course, which is looking at knowing God, and our weekly Bible studies on a Wednesday evening. If you want to find out about those, let the church office know, and we'll make sure you get the invitations to those Zoom meetings. And then finally, we were supposed to have a parish vestry meeting, but vestry meetings, because of the limits to, to people gathering, won't happen. But we will continue with an online parish consultation. So we are sending reports out from the various aspects of the life of the parish. Look at them. If you have any questions, send us an email and we'll get those questions answered. And then on the 28th, we will have an online meeting to just look at uh, where the parish is, where we're going, and what we need. So put that in your diary in the meanwhile. Today, we continue looking at knowing God. And our theme today is the love of God. In Exodus, Moses meets with God and God passes in front of him and then speaks. And he says to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So the love of God doesn't, isn't licensed. He holds us accountable. And because we couldn't do that, Jesus also says, for God so loved the world, that he sent his son to rescue us. So today we look at the amazing love of God. And as our opening hymn will say, your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. And your love is a mystery. How you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are love, that you deal with us in love and compassion, that you lift us, that you carry us. And through the service, we pray that your amazing love will touch us. Amen. Amazing 
together as one body by the Holy Spirit, I invite you to respond wherever you are, aloud or in the privacy of your mind, with Amen or praise the Lord. In Chronicles 16.36 we read, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Lord, we come before you today recognizing that you are the Almighty One, everlasting and eternal, the heavenly King above all kings. We praise your holy name. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who made heaven and earth. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O oh, praise the greatness of God. The Lord lives. Praise to my rock. O oh, praise the greatness of my Savior. Praise be to the Lord, who has given rest to his people, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant, Moses. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Lord God our Father, we have so much for which to be thankful, for the life you have given us, for our bodies so wonderfully made, for our friends and family, those who care for us and for whom we care. We thank God for our brothers and sisters in St. Luke's because their faith is growing more and more and the love we have for one another is increasing. We thank you for shelter, for daily bread, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for your protection over us. Lord, we thank you for this amazing country, so rich and diverse, filled with interesting and wonderful people. We thank you for the promise of eternal life, for forgiveness of sins. So Father, as we consider your perfection and our imperfection, thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross so that we can be saved, so that we can have life on earth in all its fullness by being freed from sin. And thank you for the promise of eternal love through the blood of Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 34, verses 4 to 7. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went out to up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name the Lord and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord the Lord the compassionate and gracious Lord slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness rebellion and sin, 
Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Hear the word of the Lord. of John, chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil 
hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the Gospel of Christ. Good morning, everyone. Our theme for today is the love of God, which is number six in our series of knowing God. There are three descriptions of God in Scripture which always need to be kept together, and they take the same format. The first one is God is spirit. The second, God is light. And the third that we're looking at today, God is love. Now, God is spirit means that God is perfectly united and complete in every aspect of his being. He's at one with himself, which is why the great statement is so important. Here, though, is thou, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. He has no limitations in space or distance, and that means that he is present everywhere at the same time. God is light means basically that God is perfectly holy and pure in every way and in everything that he says and does. He loves righteousness and he hates iniquity, which means that sin and sinners cannot come into his presence but are rejected. And then we come to God is love. And this is the most complete and all-embracing description of God. And for the Christian, it's the complete truth about God. And it means, and this is key, that God's love finds expression in everything He says and does. Everything God says and does expresses his love. Now that does not mean that God is a Santa Claus type of person, appearing occasionally with a gift and then leaving us to get on as best we can. It does mean though that God is always with us, that he is fully involved in our lives, that he is working at all times and in all ways for good towards us. And we hear Paul saying to the Romans, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Notice, in all things and for good. Everything he says and does into our lives is good and for our good. So therefore, and this can be surprising, his wrath, his anger, is good. His holiness is good. His righteousness is good. His discipline is good. His judgments are good. And his love would not be good if some of these were lacking, because it would be incomplete or just soft and mushy, where God's love is perfectly complete and perfect in every way. Because his love for us is good, he will want to develop us in our knowledge and love for him and in our God-given purpose and potential. And that means that where necessary, he will discipline us. And discipline does not just mean punishment. It also means training. And he does this to help us gain what we seek. And he will not save us from trouble when he knows we need it for our further growth and sanctification, our growth in holiness. All trouble may not come from God, but God allows it. There will also be times in our life where God will prune 
us and our lives. And notice in the story of the, the vine that it's always for good and its end result is always more fruit. God's love is not for only a select few, it's for every single Christian. And so Paul would say, God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Lovely word that, isn't it? God has poured his love. And I just have a vision of a jug of never emptying water being tilted over and that pours into my life continuously. No Christian is excluded. It's his primary gift, unlike tongues or prophecy and healing. Those are only given to some. But without love, even those can have no significance in God's sight, as Paul makes clear when writing to Corinth. And without love, we can have no meaningful relationship with God, because he will just be a distant and unknown figure. Yet, God's love is not something we need to pray for because as Paul has told us, it's already been given to us, poured into our lives, and it's there. But instead, we can pray for the Spirit to release that love inside of us, into our hearts, into our spirits, into our minds, to set it free within us, and to set us free, that we will trust it, as it moves through us. Then we will begin to know God's love for ourselves and also begin to know what it is to love as he loves and to express that love out from us. Packer sums up the truth about God's love in these ways. He says it's an exercise of his goodness towards sinners. That means God's love reaches out to all people. It's an exercise of his goodness towards individual sinners. That's me and that's you. God knows each one of us individually and he reaches out to us, calling us by name. God identifies himself with our welfare. For those who truly love, are only happy when those whom they love are happy too. And God has bound up his final happiness with us. God's love is expressed by the gift of his Son as our Saviour. For the measure of love is how much it gives. And God has given us his Son, who gave us his life that we might be with him forever. He also gives us his Holy Spirit to reveal his love to us and to enable us to receive it and to know it. And God does this because, it's his, because his intention is to bring us to know him and to enjoy him in an eternal covenant. And that's important, because not one of us is a passing whim as far as God is concerned. When he reaches out to us, he's drawing us into an eternal, committed relationship with us, where he promises to be our God forever, and to take us as his daughters and his sons forever, where we can be secure where we can have an identity that is certain and wonderful. And so, in all things, God does work for the good of those who love him. And it's for this reason that Paul gets so lyrical and enthusiastic when he writes to the church in Ephesus, because he knows what he's talking about. And so he says, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, 
He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Aren't those amazing words? Not only that we can know of God's love, but that we can receive it, experience it, enjoy it, and be filled with God himself. To enter into a salvation relationship with God is not to enter into some sort of casual comfort zone. There's nothing casual about Jesus' death on the cross, and there should be nothing casual about our response. At every level, we will encounter more of the beauty and majesty of God, as well as his awful holiness and our terrible sinfulness and capacity for unfaithfulness and selfishness. However, having once committed ourselves into his life and care, we find that we can trust him to hold us there and never to let go. And so Jude would remind us to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Or as one of John Spaker's favourite sayings reminds us, let me no more my comfort draw from my frail grasp of thee. In this alone rejoice with all thy mighty grasp of me. God is love. That love will not let us forget him and pursue our own destruction. The world is facing another wake-up call, and so are we. Lukewarmness is not an option for God, nor is it an option for love. Heavenly Father, touch your word this morning with your spirit, that it may live within us and cause us to seek after your love and to know it in the fullness of your purposes. Amen. As we reflect on the goodness of God and his glory and become aware of his presence with us, we also become aware, more aware, of our own shortcomings and failures. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So in a moment of silence, let us reflect on how we have not lived according to the commandments that Jesus gave. Let us call to mind our sins and shortcomings and lay them before God. So we confess, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Lord God, you inspired John when he wrote, 
If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that you are always true to your word, that you have heard us and forgiven us. Strengthen us to walk daily in your ways. Amen. We join together in prayers of intercession for our community and our country. Let us pray. Loving Father, we pray for your churches this morning, particularly as we're now able to meet again in a limited way. Give your church power to proclaim the gospel of Christ and grant that we and all Christian people may be united in truth and live together in love and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for the clergy and the staff here at St. Luke's, that they may carry out what you ask of them for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Father, for the resources of the world. We thank you particularly now for the skills and scientific abilities and knowledge of the people around the world who are applying their skills to developing the COVID vaccine. We pray for the nations of the world. We thank you for those who have developed and are prepared to share the vaccines they have developed with all who need them. We pray for integrity in the distribution process, that no one will strive to profit excessively from the vaccines at the expense of others who are less able to afford them, but are just as affected by this pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you too for the rain and its effect on nature around us. Lord, sometimes we in the cities don't appreciate the importance of water and where it comes from. We just open the tap and there it is. So we ask you to give us a real understanding of how important it is for our lives in every respect. We pray for our families and friends and those with special claims upon us, especially at this time. We think of those who've lost jobs and who have had to take severe financial loss due to this pandemic. And we ask you to lay your hand on them and give them courage and give them hope. To all who suffer, give courage, healing, and a steadfast trust in your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our country's government. The situation appears to be in a mess right now. But we ask that you will be close to the cabinet. Give them wisdom, give them courage to stand against what is wrong, and give them the desire to do what is right for the benefit of all in this country. Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come to the end of our worship this morning, we're reminded of the God we worship. And our last hymn, just brings us to the wonder of how great that God is. For no eye has seen and no ear has heard everything of his greatness. And so to that God we come for his blessing. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with us all now and always. Amen.
Oh, oh.